All right, well, we are studying the book of Genesis. And uh, <clears throat> let me just say that um, oftentimes... Uh, one of the things that I pray for is that God would always give me the courage to preach what needs to be preached, to preach the whole counsel of God, to preach the difficult parts of Scripture. And certainly over the last couple of weeks, as we've been delving into creation, into biblical gender roles, into roles within the family, uh, certainly there have been some things that have needed to be said from God's Word that would, um, that would rub against the grain of the culture. You also need a pastor who's going to preach the weird stuff in Scripture, and so today, I'm bringing you a sermon full of weird stuff. And I would encourage you not to be one of the Christians who is ashamed or embarrassed about what the Bible says. There's a lot of stuff in the Bible that is supernatural because we serve a supernatural God. And so we come to some of that today as we look to answer some questions about the origin of the serpent that we find in the middle of our story. And uh, my encouragement to you would just be to let the Word of God shape your worldview and not the materialism of the world around us. So with that said, I'm going to read Genesis chapter 3. I'm just going to read the first five verses. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. I'm going to pause right there. That's going to be what we delve into this morning. Let's pray, and then we'll jump into the text. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that by it you have shaped our understanding of ourselves, of you, and of the world that we live in. I pray, Lord, that today you would speak to us from your word. I pray, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable and pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. I pray, Lord, that the Spirit would be here, not only empowering the words that I say, but also helping us to hear and to understand and to apply the truth of your word to our very lives. And Lord, I do pray, especially this morning, that you would just help our minds to be rid of any of the materialism that has attached itself to our minds and to our hearts living in this materialistic world. I pray, Lord, that we would allow the word of God to shape how we think about the world that you made for us. I pray, Lord, that you would silence my lips from saying anything that is not true of you or your word this morning. May those words be, fall to the ground and be forgotten. And Lord, may you be glorified from this pulpit and in the midst of your people this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So some questions should arise when we come to this text. Like, where did this serpent come from? Why can this serpent talk? Why does it seem to be evil? What's its problem with Adam or with Eve? And for that matter, what's its problem with God? Is this evil, tempting serpent part of what God called very good at the end of chapter 1, verse 31? Where does this serpent come from? If we've spent any time in, in uh, the Word of God or any time in church, then we would know that we often attribute this serpent with Satan with the Lord of Darkness, with the devil. And a lot of, I would say, non-biblical ideas have attached themselves to the church when it comes to Satan. We know that this, sat that this serpent is Satan because in Revelation we're told that it was Satan who was in the garden, that devilish snake. So we know that from New Testament and um, other biblical passages, we know that this is Satan, but in the narrative of the story, all of a sudden we get God has created everything, everything is really good, he declares it's all very good, the one thing that wasn't really good was the fact that Adam was alone, God's fixed that problem, he created Eve, and so now you have a family in the garden of God with a mandate and a perfect world, and everything seems good, and then Genesis 3 opens and there's this crafty snake that begins to tempt. And so we have to ask the question, where did this serpent come from? Where did it get this idea of rebellion against God? Where did evil come from if God created everything good? There's all these questions for us to think about. Today we're actually just going to launch off of this text 
and we're going to try to answer some of these questions biblically. What I, what, what I would say that we're doing this morning is kind of creating or, or laying the foundation for what I would call a biblical cosmology. Cosmology is the study of the universe, the study of the origins and the, and the structure of the universe. And the Bible has something to say about how we ought to think about how the world is structured. And that's where I want to take us today. So I'm going to actually read through a whole bunch of texts. And these are probably the kinds of texts that you've just glossed over, maybe put a puzzled look on your face, but never delved too deeply into. I'm going to start in the book of Job. I'm going to go through, and I'll tell you each of the passages. You can flip along in your Bibles, especially if you start to disbelieve anything that I'm going to say. Make sure you turn to the passage and read it in your own Bible. Or you can mark them along for your later study as you be a good Berean and go and search the Scriptures to see if what I'm preaching is so. So starting in Job 1, I'm going to set the scene with Job chapter 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge about him, around him, and his house, and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. I'm just going to jump ahead one chapter to Job chapter 2. And what you'll see is that there's another of these moments. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came among them to present himself before the Lord. I won't go into the rest of that story, but there's this odd scene where God is in heaven And it says, the sons of God, the Hebrew words there are ben Elohim, sons of Elohim, sons of God, where the sons of God come to God where God is, presumably the throne room, and these sons of God, these ben Elohim come, and when they come, Satan comes as well. Now, the word Satan is not a proper name. It always always, um, uh, shows up in the Bible with a definite article. It's the Satan, Hasatan. It's the Satan. So it's not a proper name. It's a title for him. The accuser is what it means. The accuser. And so what you have is you have the sons of God coming up to present themselves before the Lord and the the adversary comes with them. The accuser, the adversary, that's what Hasatan means, comes with them as well. This is kind of strange, isn't it? You get God in the throne room and you get these sons of God, we're not quite sure what they are yet, but they come and present themselves before the Lord, and the adversary, the enemy, the one who tempted Eve in the garden, is also among those sons of God, and they come before the Lord, and the Lord and, and the adversary seem to have a conversation. All right, I'm not going to answer any of the many questions you have about that text, we're just going to jump ahead to Psalm 58, I'm going to try to string some of these things together for you. Psalm 58 Verses 1 and 2. Do you indeed decree what is right, you gods? Do you judge the children of man uprightly? No, in your hearts you devise wrongs, your hands deal out violence on the earth. So the psalmist is talking, and he's talking to a group of individuals. Do you indeed decree what is right, you gods? The word here is actually Elohim. It's the word that we often use for God himself, Elohim. Do you Elohims, plural, judge what is right? Do you judge the children of man uprightly? No, in your hearts you devise wrongs, your hands deal out violence on the earth. Who is the psalmist talking about? Is he talking about earthly kings here? Are earthly kings and earthly rulers called Elohim used the same, the same word as God? It's a good question for us. Jump ahead. Psalm 86. Psalm 86. I'm going to read verses 8, 9, and 10. 
There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations that you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name, for you are great and do wondrous things, and you alone are God. I want you to just understand again in the text here what this is saying. I'm going to use a couple of Hebrew words so you you grasp what's going on here. There is none like you among the Elohim, O Yahweh, right? That's the name of the Lord. And then at the bottom it says, for you are great and you do wondrous things. You alone are Elohim. So you are the greatest among the Elohim, O God. You alone are Elohim. Interesting. Jump to Psalm 89. Psalm 89, I'm going to start in verse 6. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A great or a God greatly to be feared in the counsel of the holy ones, and awesome above all who are around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you? What does this mean? Right? Who in the skies can be compared with Yahweh? Who among the heavenly beings? Interestingly, if you look, there should be a note there in your Bibles. Heavenly beings is the same word that we saw there in Job 1 and Job 2, the sons of God, the Ben Elohim, the sons of God. Who among the sons of God is like Yahweh, a God greatly to be feared in the counsel of the holy ones? What is this counsel and who are these people that the psalmists seem to continually be talking about? Jump ahead to Psalm 138. Psalm 138 Starting in verse 4, it says, All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. Sorry, I'm reading, uh, I'm reading the wrong part here. Look at verse one, verses 1 and 2. I'm still in Psalm 138, verses 1 and 2. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness, for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. So notice here, before the gods, before the Elohim, I sing your praise. So what the psalmist is saying is, before the gods, I sing your praise. You're the God that I worship among the gods, is essentially what the psalmist is saying. I'm just going to go one more, and there's plenty more that we could look at, but One more, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. So go to the New Testament and see if Paul has this same worldview. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, starting in verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. For although there may be be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things through whom we exist. So what Paul is saying is that though, and he says, indeed there are many, quote, gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God. So Paul is acknowledging the same worldview that the psalmist seem to be talking about, that there's a plurality of gods, but we worship the one true God. Now, before you get up out of your seats and leave, I'm not espousing any sort of polytheistic religion. I'm simply helping us understand the biblical worldview that the biblical authors had. What I want us to do is try to understand a biblical cosmology, the structure of the universe. So here's the first point that I want us to get to in understanding a biblical cosmology. God populated the heavens with celestial beings, some of whom fell into rebellion against their creator. Jump back to Genesis 1. So, again, this is the first point. God populated the heavens with celestial beings, some of whom fell into rebellion against their creator. If you look at Genesis chapter 1, and you say, okay, well, where did these celestial beings come from? Where where were they created? You remember that we said that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So that first verse tells us that God created the heavens at the same time that he created the earth. One of the first misconceptions that many Christians have about Satan 
is that there was some sort of prehistoric war in heaven in which Michael the archangel cast Satan and a third of the angels down to the earth. How many of you have heard that before? Well, one of the things that we're going to think about is if God created in the beginning the heavens and the earth, and there is not a time period for a prehistoric war in heaven, because in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And so the beginning of the creation of the world is also the beginning of the history of heaven, the beginning of the history of the celestial beings. So there's no angelic knowledge that precedes creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, where did he create the angels? Look at chapter 1, verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, and for days and for years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. So we read that, and we read that with our materialistic worldview, and we say that God created stars and he put them in the heavens, right? Yes, absolutely, that's exactly the way it reads. Genesis chapter 2, it starts with verse 1. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. Now what's interesting here is that this word host that's used in Genesis 1.14 and in Genesis 2.1 is associated biblically, this word that we translate as host, it's associated biblically with lights, with stars, with celestial beings, commonly referred to as angels, with armies, with rulers, with principalities. So this word host, you've probably heard, the Lord is the Lord God of hosts. Right, Talking about the hosts of heaven, there are times in the Old Testament the hosts of heaven is referring to the armies of heaven. Right, That the hosts of the armies came and slew all of the people when Hezekiah was praying, all of the Assyrians. So this word is associated not just with stars in the sky, but also with celestial beings, with armies, with rulers, and with principalities. Oftentimes in the scriptures, you think about um, Isaiah 13 is the um, is a prophecy against Babylon, Isaiah 19 against Egypt, and in those, think about the language that happens when, when God judges a nation. It talks about stars falling from the sky, right? Well, what are those stars? Those are rulers, those are authorities, those are principalities of those various nations that, is be, that are being thrown down to the earth when God judges a nation. More on that later, but I want you to go to one more strange passage of Scripture. Some of you who have maybe studied this before might have said, well, why didn't we go to Psalm 82? Well, let's go there now. Psalm 82. And if you've ever studied through the Psalms and you get to Psalm 82, a lot of times you'll go, I don't know what on earth is going on in this Psalm. And if you have some commentaries, especially with some liberal scholars, you'll find their answers very unsatisfactory. Psalm 82 says this, God has taken his place in the divine council. What on earth is the divine council? In the midst of the gods... He holds judgment. So again, just so we're understanding the Hebrew here, Elohim has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the Elohim, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Who's talking there? That's God, that's Yahweh, speaking to the, this divine council, speaking to the gods that he's sitting in assembly with, Right? How long, so it says, in the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. What is his judgment? He's talking to them. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and help the needy. Deliver from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. Now, what's interesting about this passage is we actually get a New Testament commentary on this passage because Jesus quotes this to the Pharisees. When the Pharisees are um, accusing Jesus of claiming his own divinity, he actually points back to this verse, and he uses it to prove his divinity. 
So when it's talking about gods, small g, it's not talking about mere human beings because Jesus appeals to this talking about divinity, talking about divinity outside of God the Father. That's Jesus' point in quoting this verse. So clearly this is not talking about merely earthly, le- earthly leaders. So who is this divine council? Who are these gods among whom Jesus or God, uh, God the Father sits and holds judgment? Well, we come back to our point. God populated the heavens with celestial beings, some of whom fell into rebellion against their creator. So there are celestial beings that God created alongside humanity, and he populated the heavens with them, but some of these divine beings rebelled. Let's look at a couple of those rebellions, and here's, here's point two. The fall, the Nephilim, and the Tower of Babel represent twin human and spiritual rebellions that drastically changed God's world. So we're, we're talking about all of this because we get to Genesis chapter 3 and we ask the question, where did this serpent come from, right? Who is this serpent? Satan, a celestial being, comes into the garden of God and tempts Adam and Eve to rebel along with him. So rather than thinking about Satan's rebellion as prehistoric, a war in heaven and he's thrown down to the earth, most scholars, most conservative biblical scholars, actually look at Genesis 3 as the fall of Satan. This is when he rebelled. This is when he fell. He came into the garden of God. He left where he was supposed to be, in the, in the, the heavenly array where God placed him, and he came down in order to tempt Adam and Eve. Okay, might seem a little bit strange, but now go to Genesis chapter 6. We're going to look at each one of these rebellions. And we'll do it quickly because we will get to Genesis 6 and Genesis 11 in our study, but we need to set it up because we're going to ask questions about where these things come from. So notice that, I'm going to go Genesis chapter 6. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, now we're familiar with that phrase, we've been looking at that, right? That's shown up in all these psalms. The sons of God, the Ben Elohim, sons of God. It says, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever for he is flesh, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. So I'm going to pause there just for a second. We are going to get here in our study. It'll be a couple months away at this point, but I'm just going to whet your appetite. There are two basic understandings of this passage. The first is that the sons of God refer to the godly line of Seth, who intermarry with the ungodly line of Noah's other children. The problem with that interpretation is, number one, that all of the masculinity is on one side and all of the femininity is on the other, right? So all the godly line took ungodly wives and it's separating so that all the gender is on one side or the other. That just seems weird and unlikely, but it's not necessarily, doesn't necessarily prove the point. The second reason that it doesn't make sense is because when a godly person and an ungodly person will say when a Christian and a non-Christian have a child, they don't spawn giants, right? There's something, there's something else going on here because generally speaking, when people are unequally yoked, their children don't come out as giants. And yet that's exactly what the Nephilim were. There were these giants, there were these heroes of old. Lots of different um, mythologies and religions around the world view, whether it's the Titans, the Giants, we'll talk about that when we get there. But the point here is that what's going on, and this is the second interpretation, which has fallen out of favor in the last several decades, and one of the reasons it's fallen out of favor is because it's weird, because we don't like it, because it messes with our materialistic mindsets. But here's the other interpretation. These sons of God are celestial beings who come and intermarry with the, with, um, the uh, uh, female human women and that celestial terrestrial union spawns these Nephilim. I think Jude and Second Peter both corroborate that reading and we'll get to there when we get to there. But here's the point, is here's a second rebellion where more of these celestial beings, more of these Ben Elohim, rebel and work against their creator and come down 
And we'll talk about this when we get there. What was this? I think this was actually a sort of uh, a genetic warfare trying to cut off the seed of the woman. And so what you have here is another celestial rebellion that forever alters God's world because what happens afterwards, in order to eradicate the Nephilim, God floods the earth. So you have the fall, you have Noah and the flood, the Nephilim, and then the Tower of Babel. And what you have at the Tower of Babel is really interesting. We'll we'll get there when we go to Genesis 11, and I'll show you all of this. But if you look at Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. So just go in your Bibles to Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. And before I read it, what... What happened at Babel is that humanity was aligned with these divine rebels, and so God scatters them and places one divine rebel over each of the 70 nations of men. Look at Job 32. So remember, Genesis 11, what happens? There's a Tower of Babel. God looks down. There's a unity in this rebellion against God. And so God goes down and scatters the people and confuses their language, right? We remember the story. Look at Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 and 9. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided up mankind, when did that happen? Right? Tower of Babel, right? It says that he placed them, scattered them along the face of the earth. So when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. So according to the number of the Ben Elohim, according to the number of these fallen celestial beings, that's how many people that he scattered and divided the earth into. Look at verse 9. But the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is his allotted heritage. Well, what happens right after Genesis chapter 11? Genesis chapter 12, where God picks Abraham and says, out of you, I'm going to create a new nation, right? So what happened at Babel is God is disinheriting the nations and choosing one nation among all of them. And it says that he numbers them according to the sons of God. So what's happening there? What's happening there is that God numbers the nations, scatters the nations, and to each nation is assigned a celestial being that has rebelled against God. Why did he do that? so that there was not unity among the rebellion of man, nor was there unity among the the rebellion of these celestial beings that that are rebelling against their creator. This is why, actually, interestingly, if you look through Scripture, um, actually, you know what, we'll get there in just a minute. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. Third point, third point. Satan is one of the sons of God, one of the Ben Elohim, who rebelled and sought to seize more power than God had delegated to him. I want you to go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel 28. I'm going to start in verse 11, and I'll read to verse 19. Moreover, the word of the Lord, so this is Ezekiel 28, starting in verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre, and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the signet of perfection. Interestingly, if you, um, uh, the Hebrew here, if there's, uh, there's one thing where if there's a, a, if there's a silent S in the Hebrew word that we, that we translate to signet here, this could actually be tr- rendered, you were the si- uh, serpent of perfection. It's interesting, um, but just a side note. Go study Hebrew. It's, it's really interesting. Um, you were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden. Okay, so let's stop for a minute here. I am not saying that this passage is about Satan. This passage is about the king of Tyre. It's about an earthly king. But there is someone to whom this earthly king, the king of Tyre, is being compared. There's an analogy being drawn. Who is it that he is being compared to, this rebellious earthly king? It says, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle. And crafted in gold uh, were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. 
You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till the unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst, and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. Just, for, um, uh, just so you know, your Bible likely has a footnote after, in verse 16 there, I destroyed you, and that word can be translated either destroyed or banished. Okay? Uh, So I destroyed or I banished you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. By the multitude of your iniquities in the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. So I brought fire out from your midst and consumed you, and I turned you to ashes on the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who know you among the peoples are appalled at you, and you have come to a dreadful, uh, to a dreadful end and shall be no more forever. If you look at the, uh, the Hebrew um, time texts here, the... Um, uh, sort of the tense that these things are in, what you see is that this destruction is a everlasting destruction. So when he's talking about destroying um, him and consuming him and uh, coming to a dreadful end, these are, um, these are uh, tenses that would say now and forever. They're ongoing. But it's interesting. So when we just read that, knowing what we know about what we've studied today, what we're thinking about um, Satan in the Garden of Eden, who is it that the king of Tyre seems to be being compared to is Satan himself, right? He was, he was the signet of perfection. He was the one who fell. He was the one who was puffed up with pride. He was the one who was tempted to grasp beyond his, his ways. If you think about there's a couple interesting things. Some scholars talk about these stones, and they say that these stones have to do with the breastplates of the high priests. And so this is actually Adam that is being compared here. But there's several stones that aren't accounted for in the breastplate of the high priests. And what's interesting is if you look at extra-biblical literature, if you look at 1st and 3rd Enoch, which I'm not saying are scripture and I'm not saying they're authoritative, but if you look at those passages, this, this stones of fire language is used to talk about the divine council, used to talk about these sons of God who had fallen. That, that the stone, stone, think, what is a stone of fire? You're thinking about stars, right? They look like a little stone that's sparkling, that's on fire. That's, and that's what these stones of fire in extra-biblical apocryphal writing are meant to signify the divine council. And so it's talking about Satan being removed from the divine council, which is why in the book of Job it says, right, the sons of God came, presented themselves uh, in front of the Lord, and the Satan was there as well. He wasn't counted among the divine council. He wasn't counted among the sons of God, but he was there also. Why wasn't he counted among them? Because here in Ezekiel, we're told that he was cast down, that he, his, he was cast out of the stones of fire. So what I think we're seeing here is that Satan is one of these sons of God who rebelled and sought to seize more power than God had delegated to him. So there's some weird stuff for you. What's the big idea? Why do, why do we need to know this stuff? Here's the big idea. Here's why I think all this is important. Because on the cross, Jesus broke the authority of these spiritual rebels and bought back the nations of the earth. On the cross, Jesus broke the authority of the spiritual rebels and bought back the nations of the earth. I'm going to read you a couple passages. I don't have time to go through them as in-depth as I wanted to, but you can jot them down. Colossians 2, 8-15. Okay, look at Colossians 2, 8 to 15. I'm just going to read verse 15 for the sake of time, but jot that down. He, talking about Jesus, disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So what that's talking about is it's talking about when Jesus died on the cross, he disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame because he had triumphed over them at the cross. Listen to this in Galatians 4. This is really interesting. 
I want you to just think of how would you, how would you understand what Paul is saying in Galatians 4 without this biblical understanding, this biblical cosmology. Galatians 4, starting in verse 1. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. So notice, what, whatever Paul is about to say is drawing on this idea that the law was like a guardian until Christ came. So I want you to think about that. What, what, what do you mean under a guardian until, until a, a, an, appo- uh, an appointed time? Verse 3. In the same way we also... When we were children, we were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. What is that? What is it? Again, think about this. In the same way, we also, when we were children, we were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer slaves, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. What, what Paul is talking about there is, how, is the, the reality. And remember, Paul talks about this elsewhere. Do you remember when Paul is talking about um, eating meat sacrificed to idols? He says, those who sacrifice meat to idols, I'm saying that they sacrifice them to demons. The whole point here is what Paul is saying is that there are elementary principles, there are celestial beings, there are rulers and principalities in the world around us that we were slaves to. But when Christ came, he broke off that slavery, and now we are attached not, um, not to these elementary principles, to these other celestial beings, but we're attached to God through Christ. Here's two, two passages that I think you're, you're likely familiar with, and if you aren't, you can jot them down. Two verses that may be familiar, and I want you to hear them as if for the first time. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you remember when Paul says, do you not know that you will judge angels? How many of you read that passage and just been like, I don't even know what he's talking about. What does it mean that we will judge angels? Well, that can also be translated, you will rule over angels. But either way, you will judge angels or you will rule over angels. What is Paul getting at there? Well, think about what it says in Revelation. Revelation chapter 2, verses 26 and 27. John says it this way, The one who overcomes and who keeps my work until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. So to those who overcome, to those who keep their faith to the end, he's talking to the church of Laodicea here, to those who overcome, he will give, what does he say? Authority to rule over the nations and to rule them with a rod of iron. What, what John is saying there is that in the eschaton, when all things are said and done, the children of God, the people of God, will displace these spiritual authorities that were given jurisdiction at the time of Babel. All of these celestial beings that were set up over the nations of man, that people worshipped as their gods, they called them Zeus and Marduk and Beelzebul and Baal and Moloch, they called them all kinds of things, But these celestial beings that ruled over various nations, God's ultimate plan in the eschaton is to displace those and allow the people of God to rule over the nations of men. When Jesus disarmed the rulers, he broke their rule and their authority, and then he tells his followers precisely that, that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Do you remember when, when Jesus was standing with Satan in the wilderness? And, and Satan was tempting Jesus. What was the last temptation that he gave him? Bow down to me, and I'll give you the nations of the earth. Notice Jesus' response there is not, you don't, you don't own the nations. They don't belong to you. That wasn't his response. He responded by saying, you shall not bow before any other, anyone other than God himself. But he doesn't correct Satan. What Satan was doing there is he was tempting Jesus to obtain what Jesus came for with, by circumventing the cross. You don't have to go to the cross and break the authority of the spiritual rebels. I'll just give you the nations if you just bow down to me. Satan says no, and instead, Satan and, uh, Jesus actually explains this to his disciples in, in Matthew chapter 12. You'll remember the story. 
uh, uh, the Pharisees accused Jesus of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul. And Jesus says, a, a kingdom divided cannot stand. He says, in order to t- plunder a strong man's house, you have to first bind up the strong man, and then you can go in and take all the stuff. Jesus wasn't giving us a how-to, you know, uh, break and enter. <laughs> Jesus was teaching his disciples something. The authority, the power needs to be taken away from the spiritual rebels before we can go and plunder their goods, before we can go and win back the nations. And then post-cross, his disciples gather to him right before he leaves, and what does he say? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. I want it back. I broke the power of the spiritual rebels. Now I own the nations, so go get them for me. Right? Go baptize them. Teach them obedience. Go get me the nations. They belong to me now. I have authority over them. That's the, the cosmic story of the gospel. That's why this is so important. Some practical implications. I'm going to go through these a little bit faster. Practical implications. Number one, don't allow the materialism of the modern world to distort your worldview. One of the reasons some of you are listening to this, and maybe it's the first time you've heard any of this kind of stuff, and it makes you a little bit uneasy. The reason it makes you a little bit uneasy is because the Bible has a lot of weird stuff in it. It's got dragons and satyrs and centaurs. It's got weird stuff in it. We need to reckon with those things. Because, you know, when I was in university as an English literature major, and we read three different books of the Bible in, in, in a pagan literature class. One of them was the, was the book of Job. And that whole council meeting where the sons of God come up and Satan's there and Satan and and God seem to have a bet over the future of Job, was something that my university professor kind of laughed at and looked at as, see, this is is one of those fantastical things that are in the Bible that show you that it's not to be taken literally. So the world understands this. The world understands that there's some weird things in the Bible that Christians get a little bit sheepish about. Don't let the materialism of the world hinder believing what the Bible says to be true. We believe in a talking serpent. We believe in a talking donkey. We believe that a giant sea monster ate Jonah and spit him up at Nineveh. We believe those things because the Bible says that they're true. But let me tell you something, that believing anything other than the Bible is even more ludicrous. You know, I'll I'll tell you a little secret. All these materialists who don't believe in all this weird stuff, you know what they believe? They believe that out of nothing, everything came. How did that happen? Well, there are these gases. Hold, hold on. Where did the gases come from? Well, they were just there. What do you mean they were just there? Who, who made them there? Well, anyway, there were these gases. And then they started this big chain reaction. Hold on a sec. What chain reaction? What were the chemicals involved? Where did those things come from? Everybody believes... You know, I'll say it this way. Everybody believes in a virgin birth. We believe in the virgin birth of Jesus, and the materialists believe in the virgin birth of the cosmos. (laughs) I'd much rather believe in our virgin birth story. So don't allow the materialism of the modern world to distort your worldview. Um, I had a couple of things to say here. Just, just, I'm going to go through them really quickly. Um, if this interests you, jot these down. I'd be more than happy to talk to you about them. In Isaiah 40, verse 26, and in Psalm 147, verse 4, God not only created the hosts of heaven, but he calls them each by name. According to Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6, and Psalm 148, verse 3, the stars worship God as their creator. In Kings 122, when Micaiah sees a vision of uh, the throne room of God, he says in verse 19, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and the whole host of heaven standing beside him at his right hand and on his left. That word host is the same word that we've talked about as being star. The host of heaven sang, right, to shepherds to announce the birth of the Messiah, a star led the Magi not only in the right direction as it was in the sky far away, but it also entered the atmosphere and it says stopped right over the house that it led the Magi to. A star, a ball of burning gas entered the earth's atmosphere, burned up the earth, and that was the end of the history. 
No, no. A star entered the atmosphere of the earth and led the Magi to the specific house where they would find Jesus. I say all that to say that the Bible describes stars as angels and angels as stars. That doesn't mean that all of those things that we look at through telescopes are actually angels dancing in the sky, but it does mean that the Bible has a much more fantastical nature to it than we often give it credit for. Angels are stars, stars are angels, stars are also burning gas balls in the sky, but somehow they led the Magi to the Messiah. What's the point in all that? Understanding biblical cosmology starts by destroying the materialism that has corrupted the lenses by which you see the world. Point number two, or implication number two, do not assign to Satan attributes that Scripture reveals for God alone. Sorry, do not assign to Satan attributes that Scripture reserves for God alone. Sometimes, see, we can fall into the ditch here on either side. Sometimes we can either... Um, in our materialistic mindset, discredit or disbelieve in the existence of Satan. Do you know, according to research done by the Barna Group, approximately 60 self 60% of the self-identifying evangelical North American world does not believe in Satan. 60% of those who would describe themselves as evangelicals don't actually believe in Satan. So we can fall into the ditch on that side where we stop believing what the Bible clearly teaches, but sometimes we can also fall into the other side because Eastern paganism often has a view where there is a yin and a yang, a light and a darkness, and these are equal opposing forces. We don't believe that. That's not a biblical worldview. Satan is not omniscient. He is not omnipotent. He is not omnipresent. Satan is in one place at one time. He cannot read your thoughts and he cannot do anything. He is a fallen celestial being. Likely, according to Ezekiel 28, a cherub, a guardian, uh, a throne guardian, who fell, who rebelled, who has immense power, but isn't even close to the power of God. That's why the Psalms say, in the midst of the Elohim, in the midst of the gods, I sing your praise. Who among the Elohim are like, is like you, O God? Because in the midst of even the celestial beings that have rebelled and fallen away from their original stated purpose, Satan's just one of those divine rebels. Just one. Last, last point. Behind human evil is spiritual rebellion that demands spiritual warfare. Why is this important? Because if we don't have this biblical cosmology, verses like this are lost to us. Ephesians 6 says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. How is it that there are forces of evil in heavenly places? Because some of God's celestial creation have rebelled and are trying to lead humanity away from worship of their creator. If we lose a biblical cosmology, we too easily allow other people to become our main enemy. Let me say that again. If we lose a biblical cosmology, we too easily allow other people to become our main enemy. The politicians who pass unjust laws the radical atheists with an opposing agenda, the sexually liberated who want to corrupt the rest of the culture with their perversions, the pseudo-churches that water down the word of God and strip it of its power. People, no matter how depraved, are not the enemy. They're what the war is being fought for. They are the ones that the war is being fought for. The enemy are principalities and the powers that have sown lies into the culture. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Our weapons are not physical. They're spiritual and they're powerful to destroy lies and demonic ideologies that usurp the truth of Christ. Only when we are acutely aware of the true battleground are we motivated by prayer, fasting, and renewing our minds. Because if Trudeau was the true enemy, we could win by political strategy. But if the true enemies are spiritual rebels in high places, then only spiritual means of grace can push back that kind of darkness. If you want to get engaged in this cosmic battle, then read your Bible daily. Sing praises with your family. Get married and be faithful to your spouse. If you're able, have lots of children and teach them to love Jesus. Fast often. 
Pray without ceasing. Love your neighbor. Share the gospel with those that God has placed in your life. The thing about spiritual warfare is this. You can't see it. But these are the things that God's word tells us breaks spiritual darkness. And so when we have an acute understanding of what the battleground is, we have a better understanding of the tools of our warfare and how it is that they bring about real changes on the earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that it's oftentimes far too wonderful for us, far too difficult for us, and so we need the help of your spirit. Help us to have a biblical worldview. Help us to believe what the word of God tells us. And help us more than anything to do what the word of God tells us to do, to be engaged in this cosmic battle of winning back the nations because Christ has broken the authority of all spiritual rebellion. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.